I'm happy to be in Ventspils. I spend a lot of time in Riga, and I discovered that there's a whole other part of Latvia outside of that city. Um, and I'm happy to share some insights with you. I know you're designers, and one of my gigs is I'm a visiting professor at a design school, South America's leading design school, and I have no formal training in design. It is the single most important and interesting fact that gets me gigs around the world. But a lot of big companies, governments, and universities really don't understand the word design. And so I'm coming to you from a very analytic perspective. I'm an MBA, PhD from London Business School. I caught the design bug quite late in life. I have never been busier and on airplanes and having more fun in my life than I am now. So you're onto something really hot. And I wanted to share some thoughts with you about designing for growth. And I put the word designing in quotation marks. You probably know this guy. I'm a great fan of Jeff Bezos. In fact, I'm doing a lot of work in Australia with something called the Sydney School of Entrepreneurship. I've been down to Australia three times and we'll be back down there in a couple of weeks. Jeff Bezos sent a congratulatory letter to all the graduates from the first course. It was a thing of beauty. Three big ideas at Amazon that we stuck with for a long time. Put the customer first, always good advice. But putting the customer first means do you understand what the customer sees? Second, invent. That's what designers are actually very good at. And then be patient. Uh, governments should be patient. Big companies are not always patient. And if you had actually invested in Amazon stock when it got started, $1,000 invested in Amazon today is $800,000 return. Fantastic. He's never paid a dividend, ever. And if you know his philosophy, it's always day one. Day one. We're still at the new part of the curve. This has been a public company since 97, and it's still day one. And when you ask him about day two, he says, don't talk to me about day two. We are always on day one. Because day two is the beginning of death. He also happens to be the, richest world, the world's richest man. Um, and he's now starting to put his wealth into philanthropy, which I'm very interested in. Why do I say that Jeff Bezos is a designer? Because he probably read this paper. And if you want, I will send this electronically to the organizers. It's one of the best pieces of work as an entrepreneurship educator I've ever seen. Sarah Sarasvati is a, a personal friend of mine. What makes entrepreneurs entrepreneurial? And the handwriting on this PDF is from a man named Finod Koshla, who is one of the world's leading venture capitalists and founder of Sun Microsystems. First good paper I've seen. And by the way, it was rejected. So the academics thought it was too radical. But what she actually discovered resonated with me, and I want to share this with you, because it's, there's a, a key message in this, expertise matters. Now, the one thing I love about designers, if you're a glass designer, a fashion designer, a furniture designer, you come to school with a portfolio of stuff you have done for years. And so if I ask you the question why you're applying, I've been doing this for 10 years. I love this. I don't get the same reaction from an engineering student filling in an application form, or similarly, a business student. So there's something uniquely inherent when somebody brings a portfolio that you are bringing a level of expertise that we often don't see in other parts of our schools. And I'd like to beg, borrow, and steal some of the good stuff coming out of design school to plant that bug this very valuable bug that I think is in this room. She talked to 27 people who've started lots of businesses. Successful, failing, and the basic design was this. If I give you this common opportunity, what would you do with it? Talk me through it, turn on the tape recorder. Now, that's a very good scientific design. What she found radically changed the way we thought about how we educate entrepreneurs. First, it starts with means. Every person in this room looks at the world with a unique lens. It's probably obvious to you. 
you talk to any entrepreneur and they say, I see an opportunity here, and they start talking to other person, and the other person shakes their head and goes, no, I don't see an opportunity here at all. And you hear this miscommunication a lot. The perception of opportunity is personal. First thing she found, 27 people looked at an opportunity, she got 27 radically different views of how to pursue it, which is interesting and both challenging. What shapes your perception? What are you into? What are you good at? And who do you know? And I see a lot of young people in the audience. I've, I've had a lot of scar tissue in my life and, and life experience. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Being passionate about changing the world sounds great. What does it actually mean? What part of the world would you like to change? Taking on a grand challenge is noble but you're likely not going to make any meaningful action unless you put into a digestible little bit. Skills. What are you good at? What don't you like doing? And avoid opportunities that rely on skills that you're not good at or hate doing. <laughs> Obvious. And then networks. Who, can you, who do you know that can help? Now, particularly among the young people, their networks are so homogenous in terms of age. These are all people of the same age cohort. So you get a rather skewed view of, of many opportunity spaces if you don't have diversity of age and experience. And similarly, these three, three things develop as you get older. I have a bigger network. I have a honed skill set. And I'm passionate about what I'm doing here. I can sniff out entrepreneurs in 30 seconds. Don't ask me how I do that. I just, there's a smell. I wish I could be in the perfume or the cologne business. And here's one of my students. His name is Calais Fries. He's 26 years old. This guy is seriously into coffee. He's the ninth ranked barista in the world. He's the Nordic Barista of the Year, three years running. I have him come into class talking about coffee, and he's like this, because he's drinking too much coffee. Had his first sip, hooked. And he looks like somebody famous. He looks like Bill Gates with a better haircut. He's actually finished his undergrad degree, and he's starting a business called Sudden Coffee, Instant Coffee. He's moved to the US with the mission of making the world's best instant coffee. Now, I'm a bit of a coffee aficionado. I have a cappuccino machine in my office. I'm a mentor this, to this guy, and I said, instant coffee? I can smell it. I don't like it. He said, no, no, no. Peter, my cappuccino in a tube, the best in the world. I'm still waiting for my sample. Guess who backed his business? Coffee snobs. Guess how they got the deal done? Over a cappuccino. So a bit of personal advice, if you're an entrepreneurial type in this room, you need to find your coffee bean, whatever your coffee bean is. But I want to challenge you a bit. There's a piece of research that has just come out that fascinates me. The average age of the most successful ventures in the United States of the founding entrepreneur at the time the business was established what would you think that number is? 42. Now, I use this slide to shock my young audience and say, if you're 20, 23, 24, you're not 42. What's the difference between a 42-year-old and a 23-year-old is life experience. So I'm interested in unpacking the notion of what life experience should somebody have to develop in the years after they graduate. And I think there's an awful lot of creative ideas that we can spawn upon that. And actually, I have to remind you, this is about Jeff Bezos. He started Amazon at age 30. He also started on the back of his family, providing him 300,000 of much needed capital. So that's principle one. The opportunity is what you see. Challenge is, how do I spend time with all of the several hundred people in this room to actually get into your head to understand what it is you see? Second principle, what are you prepared to lose? Affordable loss. Don't think about big things. Think about hypothesis and prototypes, experimentation. Now, that second word is something designers know only too well. You try something, it doesn't, you pivot, you change, you, you put something, play with it, and prototype your way to something that works, or you take a prototype that obviously doesn't work and throw it away. You probably know this guy, James Dyson. Uh, Self-made, last time I checked, six billion pounds, his net worth. He invented the cyclonic vacuum, 
to solve a practical problem in his factory because the vacuum cleaners that had bags always clogged up. So he looked to nature for the inspiration, creative idea number one. Number two, it took him 15 years and 5,127 prototypes to find the one that actually worked. So if there's a message in this, what you guys do is hard work, and it should be. That's a lot of persistence. And by the way, he did want to sell the business to the vacuum cleaner manufacturers. They all turned him down because they made money selling bags. A little trick about the design as well. As you notice, there's no bag, and it's like a power tool. And when you have a power tool, men like to use it. So ladies, if you want, if, if you want the man in your life to pick up the vacuum, buy a Dyson. It's one of the interesting things. Experimentation is also something with Amazon. You may have heard of the experiment with Amazon Go. Walk into a store, put your mobile app down, it allows you in, there's no cashiers, you pick anything you want, you walk out, there's the bill. Uh, what you might not be aware of is, this is Jeff Bezos, he basically spent $14 billion buying Whole Foods Market as his experimental lab. And if you talk to him privately, if it doesn't work, I'm prepared to write it off. That's a big affordable loss experiment. But make no, make no mistake, he's going to analyze very carefully how these shopping behaviors are in this store. It's a bunch of technology to solve what's now done by human beings. I'm asked a lot about AI versus human being interfaces. I think it's not either or, it's and. And the store is going to have to pay off because there's an awful lot of expensive technology buried in the shelves and in the ceilings. And grocery business is a pretty lousy return, single digit return business. But we will see. But he, he said, when I bought the company, this is an experiment. Third principle, you work with other people. Duh. <laughs> uh, and as this is a design oriented audience, here's one of my students. Her name is Maya. She's an industrial designer. I love industrial designers to bits. I had lunch with one today. And she had an idea. She's a mobile phone user, and all of these cords that plugged into the phones were totally incompatible. They got all kinds of nasty stuff in them. They're very hard to dispose of. She had an environmental beat about her. She'd like to design a standardized plug. Well, guess what? The manufacturers are now doing that, so there's no opportunity. But she was interested in this space, so she set up a company called PowerKiss. If you ever pick a name, this is brilliant. Pink, female entrepreneur, I'm proud of it. PowerKiss, domain name available. Three resonates with what the problem is that's being solved. And how she got the name was, every time her husband kissed her in the morning, her energy level rose. And she's a seriously nice person. And she asked, could I come to your office and talk to, talk to you about this idea? And I literally, true story, said to her, yes. But I was on a plane to New York. Observe everything. Be a very, very eager sharer of insights. I got off the plane and saw this sign. Literally after I'd been through immigration. Power mat, wireless charging, lose the cords, went to my hotel room and actually thought, hmm, I better do some background investigation about this for Maya. If I told you it's a Silicon Valley company, has raised several tens of millions of dollars, and the claim of the company is when you put the phone on their surface, it charges faster than if you phone, put it in a plug in the wall. Oops. No opportunity. I said, yes, there is. I would like you to take this tidbit, because she's a Finnish entrepreneur, and they've basically demonstrated there is space. And so she went to a furniture show, met a couple of major furniture companies. The Finnish government had a, had a program that entrepreneurs and big companies could work together on a development project. They liked each other. And they decided that the solution to the problem was electrify a table, drill a hole in a tabletop, to enable this toggle to be plugged into the phone. You put it near the device and it starts powering up. Now, you might sit there and scratch your head and go, well, she's a wireless charging company. What would this have anything to do with a furniture company? They both said, why not? It also helped that the government gave them a million euros in development finance. The story gets better. PowerMat calls up. They want to buy the company. 
36 years old, she makes a 600,000 euro capital gain because it's public knowledge in Finland, I can tell you that. And a little word about PowerMat. PowerMat is in partnership with Procter & Gamble who do Duracell batteries. Tells you something about entrepreneurs and big companies. Why didn't Duracell have the idea? Because I think the answer to some of the questions you're asking about this whole notion of design in big companies is that universities, governments, and big companies, pardon my English, suck at creativity. And they need help. <laughs> and it's difficult to handle. That's just the very nature. And in some cases, the entrepreneur has to do the de-risk. So it starts with you, affordable loss experiments, you work with other people, and then there's the element of surprise. What's the thing you didn't know before you got started that proved critical? Guess what? High growth ideas never happen in a classroom. My students, I boot them out of the class. I want you to go to the marketplace and observe become the, the very attentive observer. Now, I want you to just picture for one moment what a youth hostel looks like. Some of you, I won't ask for a show of hands who's been in one, but it probably looks like this. Bunk beds, no security, bed bugs, no check-in desk, no five-star restaurant. It's cheap, right? It's a place where students hang out during gap years. Well, I was doing a guest gig in Stockholm and I invited this guy to my class. His name is Oscar Dios. And it was a class about this size. And Oscar said he was trying to create a youth hostel at Stockholm Orlando Airport. And they were having none of it. No, we have a hotel. We don't want these cheap students with no budgets loitering around our airport. So he's hearing the word no, 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 no. He got so upset one night he went to a bar had a chat with the guy next to him, and the guy next to him said, I've been trying to open up a bar. And the airport says, no, a bar. Yes, a bar. Why? He said, I have a very innovative idea. I wanted to take the bankrupt 747 jet that's parked outside of Terminal 1 for the past, I think it was six years, and I want to move it to one of these gates and open up a bar. By the way, I think that's a fabulous idea. It would never work at Heathrow because there's not enough gates but it would work at Stockholm because there is. And click, click, click. Long story short, he cut down the security, he negotiated the parking fines, cut the security fence down, moved the plane out, put the fence back up, opened up the world's first 747 youth hostel that you can see on the approach path to Orlando Terminal 2. Who would have ever in this room thought that that was the go-to-market plan? Nobody from a conversation at a bar. It cost him two million euros to do. But the creative idea, the designer in me would tell me, youth hostel means brick and mortar. For him, youth hostel is a plane. It's all the same thing. And by the way, that's the honeymoon suite in the cockpit, if you're ever interested, I haven't been there. Although he's invited me. I, I wanna finish, I'm a Canadian by birth, North America is known for lemonade stands. And there's a lot of design in this lemonade stand, and we're going to talk about Gabby because she wants to do a Starbucks. And I think, you know, this design community, you've got such a powerful process, but you do need to know how the quote-unquote dark side works, what sells. And to become an informed salesperson, that brings out the power of being a designer. Here's Gabby. She wants to adopt a Starbucks approach. You set up a lemonade stand, you, you get money from your parents, you get a recipe from your grandmother, you get your big brother to, to protect your location. You set a price because you want some money to do something. She wants to build a whole business out of this, which is great. That's a high growth business. If she came to me as a backer, I'd like to know, did you work at Starbucks? What did you learn from Starbucks? And if, it's, if the answer is, it's only what I studied, that's not good enough to be a high growth entrepreneur and raise a serious outside money. I would suggest her go to Starbucks and learn. But it all starts with one stand. If I understand the stand, boom. Then I start asking, so why are you the person to deliver the business? It's all in how you message it. Now, despite what I said about age, I want you to meet this kid. His name is Jake Bonneau. I want to show this video because this kid 
has got everything it takes to be an entrepreneur. Uh, a little bit of background before you see him. He started, he wanted to go and get a Lego set, Star Wars Lego set, 400 bucks, and his father said, no. You want it? You earn the money. The kid says, well, I'm eight years old. What could I do? I'm only eight years old. The father said, I will help you to set up a business. So they decided to set up a lemonade stand at a local farmer's market. First year opened up, 2,000 in sales, $900 in profit, age eight. Age nine, there's a, you can't see it on that vi visual, but in the top left corner, there's a little sign called the Young Americans Bank. They lend money to little kids. He went to the bank at age nine and made a loan for $5,000, nine. I have a plan. Here's what my first year did, and I'd like to hire three more kids and give them a cut of the profits and a wage. He made 25 grand in sales, second year. Third year, he went on Shark's Tank and raised money. And I want you to meet this kid. Now, hopefully. 10-year-old boy. 10-year-old boy from Broomfield is getting a big boost for his business. Tonight, we are watching Jack Bonneau on ABC's Shark Tank. These are pictures of his watch party. His lemonade stand is bringing him some sweet success. Denver 7's Mark Stewart joins us live. Mark, this kid has more business <laughs> sense, I know, than, uh, than certainly I do. Uh, I think that is true, Shannon. And it's hard to believe that Jack here is only in the sixth grade. But if you talk to him, you would think he is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Before 10 year old Jack Beno appeared with the Sharks. Sharks, I'm seeking $50,000 in exchange for 10% of my company. He was selling lemonade at the farmer's market in Broomfield, a business created with a cause. The way that this started was just because. I wanted the Lego Star Wars Death Star. It cost $400. I asked my dad if I could get it. He said I could, but I, I would have to pay for it. So I'm like, how am I going to pay for it? I, I'm 10 years old, and it's $400. After just 12 weeks, he made $900 in profit, got his Lego set, and a new interest in being a business owner, expanding his lemonade stands to local shopping centers and stocking merchandise made by other young entrepreneurs, like dog treats and lip balm. Now he wants to take his kid-centric business model nationwide. I love just teaching the kids because it's really going to benefit them in the future. And I, I just love working with the kids and seeing them grow. And we provide everything except their mood and their enthusiasm. They all have to provide that. There's no way I'm going to let the best pitch of the year get out the door without an offer there. We'd love to take your deal. Jack walked away with a $50,000 loan and advice from some of the best in the business. Pitching in front of the Sharks was, like, unreal. There was a lot of preparation that went into it, but um, it was totally worth it. Just a great experience. I think you can get some inspiration from a 10-year-old on this, and so I wish you every success in your entrepreneurial journey. If there's a lot of designers in the crowd, you are actually entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic speech, and I'm sure the audience has questions. Please. There we are. I wanted to ask you about the patience. You said uh, one of your first slides, uh, one of uh, three uh, main statements were, uh, were like uh, patience is very much required and uh, uh, I questioned that. Uh, I, I wanted to provoke you. I work for the government and I think patience is a usual excuse for a loser. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the work I've done in Australia, I had the opportunity to meet a very big bank that has a very big reputation problem. And a very senior person at the bank came up to me and said, I hate Jeff Bezos with a passion. Why? If you actually look back at when he set up the company, the, the opening letter was very clear. I'm going on a wild ride. You're going to come in for me with, with me in the long run and don't expect any dividends. He's delivered. If you don't like those kind of stocks, there's the door. The bank lady told me something very interesting. She said, if our CEO said that, he'd be fired in a minute. Because public companies deliver in 13-week cycles. Governments have to typically deliver in their term. 
And some of the challenges that we have with governments go well beyond a term. The life horizon of those is quite, quite long. And what greatly worries me, because uh, I'm asked this question an awful lot in a slightly different way, why is places like the US different from Europe in terms of, of just entrepreneurial activity and dynamism generally? There's one design variable difference. The US doesn't have a government. They do not have a functional government, and I'm not talking about only the current president. There is not a government bureau to take a risk. The risks in the US are financed privately by people like Bezos. We need a cure for cancer on a low budget. Boom. Here's five billion. And if you've just seen the, the news, John Hopkins University, Michael Bloomberg, who might be taking a run at the presidency, is going to give a two, almost a $2 billion gift to John Hopkins for, for students to go to university who don't have the financial resources to do so. How long would it take a European government to solve this problem? But may maybe I still can add to my question. Sure. Because I, I didn't want the, uh, you to turn it like just keep patients waiting for a major no. return later. No. But, but the patience is, is uh, the life is short, of course, and, and the success of your examples is rapid. Uh, yes. and, and you still claim that just keep waiting. And I, I think that we need to urge people to act immediately. I think with some creativity, you don't know when the payoff is going to happen. Most creativity to me, which is the whole area where designers play, the outcomes are so uncertain, I would not like governments trying to tackle this. They've got my taxpayers' money. They've got obligations to society. They should be taking a long-term perspective. And I also worry that companies, on the other side, are so impatient that they're not going to fund creativity properly either. You're not going to go to a CEO of a bank and say, here, roll the dice, unless it pays off in 13 weeks. A lot of the work that's done by people in this room has uncertain payoffs of much longer time scale. But the time scale, I agree with you, is not infinite. This is where designers have to stop playing and doers have to take over. There is this handover effect. But I, I will say this, engineers and business students need to get a little bit of design dust, and by having designers work with engineers and with business students, who are typically more analytical, when you get these two together, it's uncomfortable, but you find a way to work. And I think at times you have to slow a little bit down and not be in so, such a damn rush hurry to solve a problem, because usually you go some, for something obvious than something transformative. Anybody else? Whilst they are thinking, I have monopolized, you know, microphone. Okay. No, no, <laughs> He's no, got no. the microphone, by the way. Uh, um, at the very end, you said just, uh, by the way, designers who are here, you, you are entrepreneurs. Uh, yes. why, why did you do so? I, I was given, I've been given two gigs at design school. And I was like the uncomfortable alien walking into faculty going, so where are you educated? Business school. So what are you doing here? I, it took me about two minutes to realize, because I saw the application pool and I saw the portfolios, and I said, what is that? These are portfolios. These are what students apply to get into school for. And when I started to read, and I went, within a morning, went, wow. And the more I got into the heads of how in, the, you know, designers have something going on in their head that they have to produce. Could be a digital interface of an app. Could be something tangible, like a glass or a piece of furniture. And when you talk about the process and dissect, I said, this is exactly how entrepreneurs operate. And that's where we had an intersection. What they wanted me to do was get designers more comfortable with selling. So here's a bit of advice. I can short circuit for anybody who says, everybody in this room is in sales. You want a job? That's a sales pitch. You want to get a supervisor at my time? That's a sales pitch. You want to get space in a gallery? That's a sales pitch. You want to get the attention of a CEO of a company? That is a sales pitch. And the other little secret of life is you never have enough resources and time to do anything. So you have to think creatively. And you just have to get comfortable. And I think the more comfort you get out of that, and I think the one thing I learned from a lot of designers is they're so passionate, but oftentimes they tell me they're so lonely because they're trying to do everything themselves. We are here to help. But your voice is one that should be very strong in the early ideation phase. And I have seen where companies I heard the word aesthetics. Design is much more than aesthetic. Much, much more than aesthetic. And companies that get off the rails very fast lose that empathetic voice in their organization, or it gets turned the volume down. 
and I won't tell you which company, but I'm from Finland, so you probably guess which one I'm going to talk about, or I'm thinking about. Ah. Oh. Microphone's coming your way. Okay, nice. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so Hello. the question is, how do you get the confidence? Like, do you have any tricks? Uh, because uh, I believe uh, in Nordics we have this problem sometimes uh, with the confidence. Uh, practice, 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 practice. And also get yourself in uncomfortable situations. I have very unusual teaching style. My students do group work. I'm a mentor in their team. I close the door and I'm really tough with you. And that's a very low risk place to screw up. And I also, you detach the word screw up with failure. That's a learning moment. And when you practice and practice and practice, I can see the confidence building up in my students. And when you're doing creative stuff, you've got to be uncomfortable. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, you're probably doing routine stuff. So I look for people's reaction. If I walk in and say, I have an idea, and I think it's creative, and the people are nodding like this, and it's a CEO who's got an MBA, I got the wrong idea. I'm looking for the, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about. This is very unusual. It's not our business. That's the edginess. And where your voice could particularly well be heard, point yourself as somebody who's creative and entrepreneurial. I don't like the word entrepreneurship, because it's not about starting a new business only. Being entrepreneurial is being able to grab an opportunity in a resource-constrained environment. Who says this is only about new business? So give yourself some practice. It's going to be tough. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, when, when you talk about Amazon and Bezos, uh, I immediately have this uh, red alert about uh, uh, survivorship bias. Can you comment on that? Like dangers of following something successful and thinking if I do something like they, I will be successful. Well, it might be completely unrelated. One has to remember, you go back through the history of Amazon, that that company almost failed. It almost failed. And why he was so insistent about making long-term bets is that's the protection you need for making experiments in your, in your company without getting the oversight of shareholders who get nervous. You don't like the way I operate? And to some expen extent, Tesla is the same way. Elon Musk is exactly the same way. I'm making a big long-term bet. I'm going to put the auto business out of business because these are dinosaurs who cannot create. He's probably right, but he's a bit more brash. But Bezos, is, he's a very analytic guy. Uh, one of his secrets is when pitching new ideas to him, he wants a four-page narrative, not a PowerPoint slide deck, a four-page narrative in the form of a story. Now, that's something that should be familiar in this audience. Deeply, 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 from a customer empathetic perspective, why should we be doing this? And then he has a rule in his own mind is, I am not the deal killer here. If other people in the team think this is something we should do, we should do it, even if I disagree. And then they analytically look at the experiment, and if it doesn't work, they kill it. But if there's something interesting, they take a very long-term view. That's a very interesting code for business opportunity space for the 21st century. And obviously the market is valuing this. It also helps when you start the business that way. It's quite a different thing if you have an established business and try and get a little Amazon effect when you have an established shareholder base who like to have dividends and predictable earnings. Pretty difficult to be creative in an organization like that. But I'll let you in a little secret. Big companies also spend horrific sums of money trying to solve creativity and get bugger all done. So if you can direct some of that budget, you got work for yourself. Anybody else? Yes. Hello. Great. Can oh. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for presentation. Uh, <clears throat> um, I will show the last case of selling the lemonade at home because my seven years uh, old kids were selling uh, the lemonade in a beach, in a local beach this summer. Yeah. They, got some, please, uh, do take pictures about this? Uh, do no. take pictures, because you should put this in the portfolio when they apply for school. They will have no trouble getting All in. All right, yeah. So I see we have a lot of opportunities yeah, in other markets <laughs> as well. But uh, the question is a very simple question. Do you have any receipt uh, how to involve uh, teammates who haven't been engaged in, um, uh, in design thinking? 
uh, yeah. So how, how to engage, really engage the team that hasn't been in design thinking into design thinking? I, in our experience at Alto, the most impressive course experiences are all multidisciplinary. We have all these disciplines in one classroom and form them to multidisciplinary teams. They're uncomfortable from day one. We actually bring the companies to come to campus. We don't want to talk to the companies in the company headquarters. You got to come to our campus to get out of the office to talk about something creative. Having an outside facilitator helps that conversation. And then we, you know, instead of trying to pre-plan who goes into some of those courses, we actually say we're after weirdos, crazies, and you have, have, to, have to have a, a lot of fun doing it. Because some people, you know, they want a boss, they want a role, they want to be told what to do which is a very good thing. That's, if I would roughly say that's 90% of all people who are in a large organization, that's not me. You need to know by name who these kind of 10% are to work with who kind of get the message and also do a lot of sharing. I do a lot of kind of missionary work spreading the, spreading the message around the world, which is also appreciated to have somebody from outside say it's okay to play with purpose. They want to see the purpose element of this. And when you have somebody shaking their head going, hmm, that's a completely new thing. And you manage expectations to say, you know, we might get a nugget out of this. Don't expect a finished, glossy, shiny project clear out of an ideation session. Ain't going to happen. But then the issue of how you deal with that creativity in a large organization, that's where it's a much longer, longer thing. So I think you have to organize a creativity party, it sounds like. Get an outside facility, get outside the office. Get, and get some people to play. And it's amazingly wonderful what happens when a CEO puts a smile on his face. Because it's okay to play. It's got to be shown with purpose, though. I had some questions about education, which you partly already answered. Yes. I wanted to ask, what do you think is important to include also lessons in business at the design school and the vice versa? Business school and design? Or let the guys work together for some while? If, if I can give you a sales pitch, because I got this gig in Australia, I've been there now three times this year, going back a fourth time. It's happening incredibly fast. Uh, entrepreneurship is a domain that every government wants to talk about. Entrepreneurship is yes. a design infused process. So guess who should be in the room? Guess where the initial creative spark is going to come from? It's going to come from design schools. So partly is to raise the voice of designers to say, you know what, you are critical to a bigger process. And I'd like to see the designers get some more exposure, particularly into the engineering focus, because the engineers work from, they want to get down to it, what are we doing? which at some point, it, that's what successful people do. Enough play, what do we do? It can't all be play, but you have to have some play to do. And similarly, the bigger challenge is business schools particularly are really interested in this world, world, word called business design, but they don't understand it. They can't do new things in their curriculum. So I do many things in business school on the off side because I said, here's a guy with an MBA and a PhD from London Business School. He looks like he's an okay business professor on paper until I get into a room and start playing. And when you start to create a dialogue and actually put the, the designer up on a pedestal, because I have them stand up in my class and say, here's the designers. Oh, we have oh, uh, six of them and there's eight teams. One designer per team, two of you are out of luck. Suddenly the most valuable resource in the room is the designer. And they usually have a strong voice at the beginning of ideation, and at some point the handoff towards particularly the engineering side happens to make a project successful. So you have to pat yourself on the back. You have no idea how powerful your discipline is. Ideal pointed that out a few years ago, but it's a lot more than that. And I have lots of friends at Stanford. I've met David Kelly, he's a really nice guy. You need a playful habitat, you need playful faculty, playful students, real challenges, and there's a huge market out there for large organizations if you frame the sale as creativity, not entrepreneurship. They don't want to hear about, a company does not want to hear about entrepreneurship. They don't want to hear about a young kid disrupting a business. But guess what? I've worked with people in my MBA class who are disrupting their business, and they have a private conversation with me, and I, I give them some advice to actually quit. 
but I wouldn't go to the company and say, pay me big bucks to go in and talk about something entrepreneurship related and the CEO saying, this guy's gonna come in and all my people are gonna leave. So think of this word creativity. You gotta figure out exactly what it is you're selling. You've got all, such a valuable skill set here. And I'm a living proof. I didn't have a design education, but I, I have a great empathy for what you people do and the power of what I see this doing. So if you use this word entrepreneurship, you're going to get an angle in because everybody wants curriculum like that. That was an important message, I think. Good. Thank you. Thank you.